Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Grumman Pilots' YouTube channel, directly supporting the Grumman Pilots Association. And this morning, our topic is going to be emergency procedures. Now, this is based upon an AOPA's Air Safety Foundation seminar. You might remember that back in the 2006 and 2007 time frame, I was one of their traveling speakers giving these talks, and this is what I remember, and I'd like to thank them for all their help in making this possible. Emergency procedures are important for pilots to know, and with that, let's just jump right into it. So what causes emergencies? Well, they're caused by pilots. They're caused by thunderstorms, ice, engine problems, electrical problems, spatial disorientation, and several other things. And you know, despite all your great planning and your wonderful practice that you've done time and time again, things sometimes go wrong. And so you have to move beyond what's going on and you have to handle the emergency. So now let's deal with the problem. So exactly what is an emergency? It may seem pretty obvious to you and I, but when you really think about it, it's kind of hard to pin down. It all depends upon the pilot, the airplane, and the circumstances. So let's look into that. And context is everything in an emergency situation. Not every problem rises to the level of an emergency. Again, context. What may be abnormal in one situation could easily be an emergency in another. There's no question, but sometimes the distinctions are very subtle. Let's say you're in a twin and you lose an engine failure. Are you at 200 AGL on takeoff or 10,000 feet in cruise? Are you over water? Are you over land? Are you in VFR or IFR conditions? Do you know you have a fire? These are all the context of problems that we have to ask. So in general terms, time is a critical dimension in an emergency, but not every emergency is a hurry up situation. You don't want to make a rash action. Now having your door open is a potentially abnormal situation it's not a good thing, but it's not something that's going to bring the airplane down in short order. The accident reports show you're much, much more likely to get in trouble trying to solve a problem instead of flying the airplane. Inaction in an emergency can also turn an abnormal situation into an emergency. Let's take a classic case of an abnormal situation being allowed to escalate into an emergency. And this is the case in point, the 1978 Portland, Oregon, McDonnell Douglas DC-3. Crew notices abnormal aircraft behavior during gear extension on approach to Portland. Delays landing while trying to access the nature of the problem. We're sure the gear situation really was, but indications that it was down. It was circling at low altitude, burning lots of fuel, continued to troubleshoot the gear issue even after they finished talking to the company maintenance and had been assured they'd done everything possible to verify the status of the gear. No way the gear problem itself would have been this bad. Engine flames out resulting in crash landing and several deaths. Flight officer failed to speak up about the fuel situation strongly enough and the full report is available on AvWeb under safety in its report number 183016-1. When you notice something wrong, the first step is to perform an initial assessment. Just a very basic initial determination of the problem. What's basically wrong? How bad is it? And how much time do I have to react to this problem? If it's critical, do you deal with it immediately? But do you really remember all the stuff you have to do to handle the emergency? Was your bad training? Did you just memorize it to pass the test? Were you asleep for that part of the instruction or training? These are all things you have to ask yourself. Are you on your toes? Did your only engine quit? Are you 500 feet above the ground? Is there water ahead? Are you really going to step out and try to start your engine like this in a cub? I doubt it. Certain emergencies, like an engine failure on takeoff, are so critical and require such quick action that we essentially have to be spring-loaded and have a can response for them. That's why crews in the airlines practice emergencies over and over and over to have a good quick response. And once you notice a problem, don't act rashly to solve it. You should remember the three things. You want to aviate, 
You want to navigate and be sure to communicate. Sometimes you have to be a detective. You're trying to interpret the information provided by multiple sources to try to figure out what's going on to keep it from getting worse and causing other problems. It's surprising how many problems are self-induced. Switching to an empty fuel tank, reaching for the wrong lever in a twin. If an action you took seems to cause a problem, there's a good chance it did, so you might want to do the opposite. And with respect to checklist and emergency situation, it's best to have immediate action steps for certain situations committed to memory. We just discussed that. And then once the immediate situation is under control, now's the time to break out the checklist and verify that you did act correctly. If circumstances and time allow, by all means, get some help. Don't go to 122.5 if you already have a good frequency. Just the idea that the FAA gives you an unlimited supply of emergencies, as long as there at least is some justification for them, you're okay. And be sure to declare that emergency. Let's shift gears here and let's talk about some specific emergencies. So you're in an emergency. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Most people think engine failure. Could it be as simply when the engine suddenly up and dies that you change to an empty tank? Well, here's one people talk about. The engine failure just after takeoff and whether it's possible to return to the runway when you're, say, between 300 and 1,000 feet AGL. So now we're going to take advantage of Microsoft's Flight Simulator using the baseline scenario here for the impossible turn, and we're going to look at several attempts to solve the problem and get back to the airport. Which of these banks would you use to get back to the airport? We're going to look at the flight simulator. We're going to examine each of these four banks and see what happens to us.
in the real world, you're not going to react immediately. So you can probably allow five to seven seconds before action is possible. And that's the difference between making it back and landing short. Take a look at these and let's look at the real world and see what happens. In real life, an emergency is not going to be the sterile exercise that you're used to in training. The engine may be shaking, there's probably oil on the windshield, possibility of some smoke and fire. There's a reality factor that you may not have counted for. On the bright side, you're probably going to have a few clues that there's something going on before shutdown. A dramatic change in oil consumption in the hours leading up to the failure. Maybe it's just an unusual indication on an engine monitor, but you probably did get some indication of it if you care to look back. We talk a lot about complete engine failures, but partial loss of power is probably more common. If you're in a situation like this, troubleshoot the obvious first. Is the car icing up? Did you forget to advance the mixture on descent? If not, it's most likely a problem with a cylinder or the valve train, fuel, or ignition. The engine will be running low. Unless it's tearing itself off the mount, it's best to leave the throttle alone. Start contingency planning. Get to an airport and be ready to lose the engine at any time. Fire is a scary prospect. There's a tendency to panic at the first tent of smoke, but you shouldn't. Electrical issues often resolve themselves. A wire, filament, whatever burns through, makes some smoke, pops a breaker, and that's it. Fire, are you actually on fire? If so, what can you do to stop it? Fly the airplane, get on the ground, off airport if necessary. Firefighting is not something we talk about a lot about when we're doing our private pilot training. But if it's the engine, you can't risk letting it continue very long. Shutting down, stopping the fuel, getting it down. Use a slide slip to help dissipate the fire and smoke. 
Um, there are smoke hoods that you can wear in the cockpit. Open a door, open a canopy, get some air in there, but by all means, carry an extinguisher and use it if needed. What if you lose your vacuum pump? Are you an IMC? If you are, it's a very big deal. If it's VMC, you just need to stay VMC. When you have a vacuum pump failure, it's critical to recognize that failure. Annunciators are extremely helpful. Definitely be comfortable with partial panel work, and that's part of your recurrent training to prepare for emergencies like this. Let's say your emergency is lost calm. That's where having a headset adapter for your handheld and an external antenna. A handheld radio on a rubber duck inside of a cockpit is good for about a mile, mile and a half. If you have an external antenna, 10 to 20 miles is your range. So consider your options. And if you have an electrical failure, it's always nice to have a flashlight, even though Roy Machado has been um, credited with saying storage of dead batteries is all a flashlight is good for. But if you've got one, you'll be using it. So are your flight controls acting up? It's very rare, but it could happen. And there are lines of aircraft that do have ADs against the control surfaces. So know your airplane. So if you do have a problem with the airframe, get it on the ground. On the bright side, airplanes are pretty tough machines. You'll be able to abuse them pretty bad, and you won't induce a whole lot of structural failure. And they'll continue to fly in some cases. Unless circumstances are extraordinary, this probably is an emergency. Like the JetBlue case, got lots of media attention, but very little real danger. So something's wrong, but you don't know what? Don't jump to conclusions and don't freak out. Is your lost calm just an unplugged mice cord? And fly the airplane. Most will fly just fine with doors, windows, access panels, etc. open. If you're trying to approach a stall or trying some other maneuver just to close the door, stop and think about what you're doing. If you're carrying passengers a lot, you'll eventually experience something like this. The bottom line for all of this is, whatever happens, fly the airplane safely. It's obvious, but if you don't get there safely, nobody does. Get the aircraft on the ground, but do it safely. Get priority by declaring an emergency if necessary. Have ATC Unicom arrange services for you on the ground. And as things go, your pilot operating handbook probably doesn't cover every situation. So that's why recurrent training is very important. It's the non-textbook emergencies that really surprise people. I'm Monty Coles, Charleston, West Virginia, and I learned firsthand the other day about maintaining your concentration on flying an airplane, irregardless of what is happening around you. On an instrument scan, I noticed this little head appear in a small hole at the top of the instrument panel, looking around for something to either cover the hole or grab it, and it came out about four inches and wiggled its tongue at me, so I grabbed my sporty's handheld radio and just smacked it real hard, which sent batteries flying all over the cabin. Fell down through the instrument panel onto my feet, and I was kicking like mad. It felt a lot heavier than what I expected, and I thought, well, I'll open the door, and if it wants out, it can get out. And before I could get to the door handles, it had shot across the floor and up the door, and and I just grabbed him by the neck and held on for dear life. I was squeezing his neck. He wrapped around my arm. He reaches down with his tail and wraps around the uh, flap handle and was pulling on it. I thought it did occur to me, you know, if I crashed and uh, destroyed the plane and myself and the snake slithered out somewhere, there wouldn't be any evidence of a snake or a problem that had occurred. When that head first appeared, I thought, what am I going to do? And my uh, instructor's voice from 25 or so years ago, Benny Mallory, came back to me, said, whatever happens, fly the plane, fly the plane. And he still grounds that into people. And by then, I'm within about three or four miles of Gallipolis, and there was a bunch of planes uh, doing touch and goes. I said, I'd appreciate a priority on runway five for a straight in. I got a problem. And I proceeded and landed, taxied up to the pumps. And after a few pictures, one of them said, uh, you know, the landing you made, you ought to take that snake with you all the time. 
I really never thought anything like this would happen to me. About the only thing in weather that we really have to worry about other than thunderstorms is ice. It can accumulate in a hurry. And whatever you do, one recommendation is you fly back to the point where you didn't have ice. Turn around and go back. However, if the last place that you didn't have ice was your airplane sitting in your hangar, we can't help you. When things are going downhill, sometimes the best thing is just to get the airplane on the ground, whether there's an airport beneath you or not, a road, a field, and just wait the weather out. While many people might Monday morning quarterback what you did, the fact remains that you are alive and that you walked away from it. Okay, so you're going down. Let's talk about some ways that you can do that as safely as possible. Those are some interesting statistics. There's a fair chance that if you put the airplane down um, off airport, you're avoiding death and destruction, whether or not the airframe takes any damage or not. If you have to, try to maximize your glide, picking L over D. You want the airplane to stay in the air as long as possible, so you're extending your time up there. So you want to remember to get your airspeed under control. Try for best glide. And if the number is not there, try for the best rate of climb. If the airplane's light, it might actually be able to knock a few knots off that number. And are you going to stretch your glide? If you're in a twin, you might want to stop a prop. But do you want to go through all of it to stop the prop in a single? Probably only going to buy you a couple hundred feet, but it might be the couple hundred feet you need. It will be for you to decide. And finding a feel. Your GPS, most of them have a nearest tool. Keep in mind, though, it's not always the case. There was a pilot in 2005 had an engine out, hit nearest, and it only showed the airports that were ahead of him, not the airport that was a quarter mile behind him. And you're going to land the airplane. Slower is probably better. Try to keep the airplane under some semblance of control for as long as possible. Well, you want it to be slow, but don't get the airplane slow, slow that it stalls and you go head in because that sudden stop will get your attention. You want to keep that energy slow so that your body doesn't have to suffer so much. The airplane will take 9 Gs and you can do it too if your weight is distributed properly. So make sure you're wearing your seatbelt and your shoulder harness too. Overall energy is critical. Do you have a headwind or do you have a tailwind? Make sure you're picking a spot where you can dissipate all your speed before you come to a stop. And that will give you a successful landing. Remember, energy is critical to maintain. And when you pick a field, be sure you land with the rows, not 90 degrees to them. And keep in mind that tall crops like corn can actually stop an aircraft and flip it over on its back. Well, roads look pretty good to most pilots, sort of like a runway, but it may not always be the best choice. Rule of thumb, if you're going to endanger or injure people on the ground, don't do it. This is your emergency. Don't turn it into someone else's. So be careful when landing on roads and watch out for power lines and other obstructions. And if you're going to put it in the trees, you might want to look for smaller, wide space new growth trees. They might be a little softer. I keep in point from the Civil Air Patrol back in Mississippi was that most of the people who were injured when a Cessna went into the trees and hung up, they would open a door, look down, and then undo their seatbelt and fall out of the airplane and then break an arm or a leg. Choosing between water and trees, water is probably the better choice. A lot of people think it's softer and it usually can be. Are you carrying flotation devices that you have to leave the airplane? But believe it or not, landing an airplane in water under control is a highly survivable experience that appears to take very little skill, experience, or preparation. So the odds are in your favor. One thing to do in terrain is if you have to land, try landing uphill. That way gravity is working against the airplane and helps dissipate the energy fairly quickly. However, obstructions become quite the problem. We've all heard about an engine emergency at night. Turn on your landing light. If you don't like what you see, turn it off. But it helps if you know your terrain. That's always good to know the area you're flying over so you know where you're going to put down because you're not going to be seeing the wires and other obstructions at night until it's too late. Does the gear stay up or down? 
it depends on what you're landing on. If you're going to be landing on a flat surface, then gear down. But if you're going to be landing in a mushy, fresh plowed field, probably gear up. It just all depends upon the circumstances and the context that you're in. And do some of your preparation in flight. Make sure everybody's seatbelts are on and they're snug tight. Brief your passengers what's going to happen and let them know so they're not going to be surprised when you go down. What do you do to prepare? Turn off the master switch, that way you won't have any electricity that could start a fire, but there'll be a plenty of hot metal from the engine and the exhaust that may cause that. Popping doors and relatching them are all things you might want to consider. Don't too get too caught up in getting everything ready for the landing that you lose track of what the airplane is doing. Use your passengers and fly the airplane. My name is Gordon Webster. In 1991, I crashed my 1958 Bonanza into a cemetery in Knoxville due to the left rear cylinder blowing off. Really never thought I would uh, end up in a cemetery after an airplane crash and actually walk away from the cemetery. I was just going to make a precautionary landing at the uh, McGee-Tyson Airport, which I was passing by at that point. I called them and asked for if I could just turn, come in for landing, and they said, you're clear, go any, you know, use any runway you want, the C-130 will be out of your way. Just as I turned final, this little slight feeling exploded in the fire, smoke, and oil covered the windshield, and I immediately hit the mic button and Tyson Tower. This is definitely a mayday. Within just moments, saw that I'm not going to make it. Thought a moment about, you know, should I put the gear down, not, and inside it, I better leave it up to be on the safe side. When I hit the ground, I held the nose up. Uh, I had the yoke pulled back hard as I could pull it. And as the nose drooped a little, the prop hit the ground, kicked the airplane sideways a little, and then the prop hit the ground again, and it stopped. And a little while here came the news crews, and I finally said something to them where they're having a slow news day, and they said, we just love uh, airplane crashes. And, of course, I made the front page of the paper the next day and all the news cast, and it was a big deal. Things that I did wrong was almost stalling the airplane because not immediately setting my glide speed and paying attention to that. I almost missed that while doing other things in preparation for a quick landing. I did not open the door, which I should have reached across and unlatched. Don't ever give up uh, any altitude you have when there's a possible problem until you've got the runway made. In spite of all the preparation you do, you never really think it's going to happen to you but it can, as shown by my experience in 1991. Be sure to file a flight plan. That way they'll know where to start looking for you. It's easier to find a downed aircraft than a person, <clears throat> and the aircraft can provide some degree of safety. And be sure to dress appropriately and bring heavier clothing and stuff in winter to keep you warm. And as pilots, you know that in February 1st of 2009, they quit listening in on 121.5 for ELTs, which is why they're, most people are going to the 406 megahertz versions. So we have some better alternatives now for ELTs, 406 megahertz. You can go a personal locator beacon, and or you can go with a GPS link. Now these are not cheap, but it's a lot like AOPA members paying legal services plan. No one plans to need good legal advice or to get in an airplane crash, but these events take place every day. Keeping a cell phone on your person is good. Having a survival kit in the airplane is really nice, as well as food and water rations for you to consume during your stay until you are fine. If your emergency rations comes from peanut butter crackers and Diet Coke, you're probably out of luck. You'll never be totally ready, but you can practice, you can mentally rehearse, you can stay situationally aware, and you can manage your risk when you're flying over bad terrain. These are all things that a good pilot can do. The truth is, most emergencies are pilot-induced. The majority of dead stick landings occur because the pilot ran out of gas. Don't do that, and odds improve a lot. Well, thank you for watching this. We appreciate you watching Roman Pilot's YouTube channel. I'd like to thank AOPA and the Air Safety Foundation for making this material available. And again, continue safely. Hope you never have an emergency procedure. Thanks for watching.